we take a second because it's going to turn this one off and come back and check the battery level. Okay. Make sure sometimes. Sometimes they'll, they'll start to move. Huh. You get well, you got to give it, I guess the right way to say it, you got to give it a little bit, a few seconds for it to kind of read it and then. Mm -hmm. Do you want to mute this? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. There's a red button on here. Mm -hmm. So right now it is not. I need to do that. Okay. Red button. Click it once. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. You can sit here. I'm just waiting for him to. <laughs> They I think it's going to be a largely virtual audience today. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I can hold it. I mean, I'm just am, you know, whatever. I don't feel obligated. Yeah. I love it. I'm scared again. So complicated. Just dealing with because of the WebEx stuff. Yeah. No, it said it's the sign on there. Didn't you see the sign? I just tried to get it to you. Yeah, it says it's not working right now. So it's basically free. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Have fun. Thanks. Okay. Enjoy, enjoy. So now I removed it. The video for the stage. It's just showing this. Okay. We still want the video, the speaker to be seen. Yeah. Um, I don't want to have a thumbnail. 
includes photos and artifact cached replicas on loan from the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology and the Queen Anne's Revenge Lab. It is also complemented with artifacts from the Country Doctor Museum. Today's presentation is Investigating Morbidity and Mortality in the Ancient Near East. Our presenter is Megan A. Perry, PhD, Professor, Department of Anthropology. Dr. Perry is a professor of anthropology with East Carolina University. She holds her degrees from the University of New Mexico, Case Western Reserve University, and Boston University. Her primary research interests involve investigating human skeletal remains to assess ancient disease, diet, and mobility patterns, in addition to mortuary practices of ancient populations in 1st century BC to 6th century AD and 19th century Jordan. Her bioarchaeological research at Petra focuses on how one neighborhood in the ancient city adapted to their increasingly urban environment through evidence of physiological stress, isotopic evidence of diet and migration, population demography, and sources of the site's most important resource, water. She is also investigating the social and biological determinants of metabolic disease in 19th century Jordan. Uh, Professor Perry has been working on archaeological projects in Jordan for 30 years, and she is on the board of the American Center of Research in Amman, Jordan. Here is Dr. Megan Perry with Investigating Morbidity and Mortality in the Ancient Near East. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to take off my mask, and it feels very freeing, actually. Um, so thank you so much for coming to this talk today on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. And fall has finally arrived, I think, at least before the hurricane comes. I'm not sure. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit today. First, oh, first of all, I want to thank um, Marlena, who's not here today, unfortunately. She's sick for inviting me to give a talk with the medical history series. And I've enjoyed a lot of the previous lectures ever since um, I first came to ECU almost um, 20 years ago. So first I'm gonna discuss how we can study ancient disease in bone. So this is basically a, a, a talk that's going to not so much focus on sort of the broader archeological histor and historical implications of my research, but it's going to kind of more focus on, well, how do we even know what kind of diseases people had in the past anyway? And I'm gonna go into two examples of applying this study of ancient disease or paleopathology to two different contexts in Jordan. I'm gonna focus first on my work in Petra um, at, uh, from skeletal remains that date from the second century BC, the first century AD. And then I'm gonna talk about my work at Hespan, which is much later. And Last night I was watching the Jeffrey Dahmer documentary on Netflix and I had to take screenshots of this, of these um, moments in the, um, in the show, you know, what do you, so they're asking, the investigators are asking Jeffrey Dahmer, why do you think, or what do you think drove you to try to dig up a dead body, you know, because most people wouldn't do that. And I'm like, okay, I, I would, but not to do what he was gonna do to it, let's just be clear on that. So bone metabolism um, is a dynamic process that balances bone formation and bone resorption. And central to this process is this rank rankle OPG pathway that regulates when bone's gonna be taken away by osteoclasts or put down or um, produced by osteoblasts. Um, but this homeostasis in the system can actually be altered by a number of different things, such as immune responses to particular diseases or infections, the disease process itself, um, metabolic deficiencies or other nutritional issues, hormonal imbalances, genetics or epigenetics as well, and even iatrogenic factors such as taking certain medications. As a result of some of these factors, depending on what they are, um, osteoclasts and osteoblasts, so the cells that take away bone and build bone, will be triggered to act in a sort of abnormal pattern, sort of throwing the system out of homeostasis 
and resulting in excess removal of bone or formation of bone, essentially. So paleopathology then is at its very simplest studying evidence of abnormal bone metabolic processes um, due to ancient disease or injury or any of the other factors I was talking about in skeletal remains, in human remains, I mean, I'm sorry, in human mummified tissues or in hair and even in coprolites, so ancient poop. Um, paleogenomics is becoming an increasingly important component of this study, um, extracting the DNA of ancient pathogens in order to understand the evolutionary, and evolutionary history of disease um, and humans in response to these diseases is um, coming increasingly um, part, of the, um, part of the toolkit. But in most cases, the study of ancient disease starts with the identification of a pathological or abnormal state in bone. And a big part of that is actually making sure it's sort of an in vivo process, right? It's not something that is due to the burial environment causing destruction to the remains, nor is it representing normal human variation. So it's not always as easy as you'd think, actually. So um, things like scavenging animals or even a wayward archaeological trowel can damage bone to the extent that it, it mimics skeletal lesions. And so I have some examples here. Um, I do have, it doesn't show up. Oh, funny. I guess it's just the, the, these new screens don't, you can't use the pointer, but I can point. So you've got, um, oh, but then people on WebEx can't see me. Whatever. On the right, you've got... Um, damage that happened to the bone right around the time of death. Um, on the second from the right, you've got post-mortem damage, um, probably maybe from something in the burial environment, not really sure. Um, and then on the very far left, you've got an example of normal human variation that could cause something that looks like a, a pathological lesion. It's actually just a very large sternal formation, I mean, foramen. And then on the second from the left is another in vivo disease process that causes porosity in bone. So even though these are all holes, right, in bone, they're not necessarily all due to things that are happening when the person was alive. Um, then the next step, of course, is to look at these, um, these different lesions in the bone. There are actually you know, pathological, and then try to determine the cause through differential diagnosis. Now, our limitations, of course, are that bone can only really respond to a disease process or trauma by, as I said, resorbing bone with osteoclasts um, or inhibiting bone mineralization. Um, this is especially important during growth and development, or it could result in the formation of abnormal new bone with osteoblasts. And in sort of in order to really assess the cause, we need to actually look at the pathophysiological processes that led to the lesion that we're looking at. Um, for example, here are three conditions that actually all resulted in um, or, or, or created bone resorption, right? In the case of, of the far right one, syphilis, we actually have some abnormal bone growth going on as well. But these are all from very different um, types of uh, types of processes or types of diseases. Um, so you want to take into consideration, of course, its location on the bone, what type of bone is affected, um, its distribution across the body. You would want to take into consideration, like, is the individual old or young? Um, and you would, if you can, get an idea of crude prevalence of the sample, right? Is this a condition that would be pretty rare? Or is it a condition that would be maybe like an infectious disease that could be spread throughout the population. In the first case, you would only expect one or two cases of it. If it's something rare, if it's something that's you know, more infectious and easily spread, right? you would expect to see a, a larger number of individuals in the sample that have it. right? So this can kind of help you narrow down what it actually is. Um, and so it can help you, you know, generate a possible diagnosis. Now, there are a whole bunch of indicators, though, in the skeleton that can't be classified because the skeleton has such a limited way of responding. Um, more often than not, there are skeletal lesions that can't really be attributed to something, but we know there's something going on. There's some kind of adverse condition in the body, which 
as bioarchaeologists and paleopathologists, we refer to by this funny term stress, um, which is kind of unique to our field. Um, it's not always well defined, but in general, it can be thought of as disruption to physiological homeostasis in the body, right, produced by external agents. So we know that these kind of, we know something about the pathophysiology of these three, these are just three examples. Um, we understand how they can be formed, right, the pathophysiological process behind them. So for example, we know that um, subperiosteal bone formation is a response to inflammation near the bone, which is of course a part of the normal immune response, right? But we don't know what actually is triggering that immune response and why then it's triggering that inflammation in that particular region, right? So it's, we can know something's going on, but we don't know, always know what it is. It might be malnutrition, it might be infectious disease or some, um, you know, some other kind of um, condition that's affecting the immune system, or it could be, you know, exacerbation of one with the other, sort of those two things have synergistic relationships, right? So it could be a combination of both bad nutrition and infectious disease. Um, another one that is um, a little different is looking at evidence of inhibited fetal and juvenile growth. So for example, these linear enamel hypoplasias that um, can be seen in dental enamel occur when, um, when something impacts enamel formation and mineralization in the teeth, right? And we can see this in other parts of the skeleton as well, where there's been some at some important point of growth in that part of the skeleton that something will have affected its ability to sort of grow normally or at a, a or lay down, um, in this case, is um, the normal amount of enamel. So first, I'm um, gonna go to the first example, right? Studying human remains from the ancient city of Petra, which is the capital of the Nebatean kingdom. So you can see here on the right, right? Petra kind of right there, smack dab in the middle of the Nebatean kingdom. Um, this kingdom was established in the second century BC by King Eritas I and was um, eventually annexed by Rome in the early part of the second century AD. In, in the interim, it served as a major economic center, a major trade center that served as an entrepot for goods coming from like Saudi Arabia, you know, the Radium Peninsula, um, you know, parts of the Persian Gulf, even India, and bringing those goods over to the Mediterranean and to the Roman Empire, right? So the area that we've been excavating, um, I've actually been working there since 1998, but then in 2012, I was joined by a colleague of mine, S. Thomas Parker at North Carolina State, is something called the North Ridge, which is located here um, on the far left side of the, of the map here. Um, and you can see downtown Petra sort of in the center. And we've been excavating a number of tombs that were dug into the, you can kind of see there's exposed bedrock up there. Um, and I'll bring up our excavation map, which I sort of had to rotate because, because it's at the wrong angle. But you can see that top of the ridge is actually where the city wall runs. And we're working on um, some tombs on either side of the city wall. The city wall was probably built right around the time of the Roman annexation. So we have uncovered, um, so these are the examples of the, the types of tombs that we've excavated. These are not the pretty big facade tombs that when we normally think of Petra, the one that's on the flyer, for example, right? We don't, we're not, we haven't excavated those. Um, other people have, but we haven't. But we're working on these um, kind of more um, middling tombs, I guess you could say, that sort of um, have this, it's basically a shaft cut into the bedrock. It opens into a big chamber that has a number of receptacles for the dead. And we uncovered the remains of about 120 people um, most of them were um, largely disturbed. Um, as you can see on the right, that's commingled fragmented skeletal remains. Um, though we did have a few that were articulated and sort of laid out in a primary burial manner. Um, so what the Nebateans would do is after a body had decomposed and let's say there was a new death within their kin group, they would take the remains of the decomposed decedent, gather them, put them in a receptacle, 
Um, and then, you know, another, basically another thing cut up down into the bedrock and then put the new body in, in its place. So that's why we have these, um, a large number of these commingled assemblages is from their mortuary practices. Some was due to tomb looting, which is a whole other issue. Um, so we were able to um, see a few skeletal lesions in the sample, but actually not that many. So for a paleopathologist, Petra was kind of boring. Um, as an archaeologist, it's really awesome, right? But in terms of their skeletal remains, yeah, not so much going on. So we found mostly lesions of the nonspecific variety, right? We found some evidence of periosteal inflammation. If I haven't mentioned already, periosteum is sort of a, a fibrous membrane that is on the outside of the bone surface. I realized I, I forgot to mention that when I was talking about subperiosteal bone formation. So when you have subperiosteal bone formation, it's generally, as you can see in the upper left slide, like new bone, sort of irregular new bone being um, laid down on top of the normal bone surface. Um, and that's evidence of the periosteum um, un, you know, being affected by inflammation. Um, so we had that. We also had some linear enamel hypoplasias, those stoppages of dental enamel growth. Um, but that was kind of it. We had a lot of osteoarthritis. We didn't see a lot of abnormal porosity in any of the bones, including um, the type that you see in the slide here on the right. This is due to um, anemia of an, uh, of an undisclosed cause. We don't really know what's causing the anemia. We just know that the spongy bone in the skull is expanding to increase red blood cell production. So that's why it's a nonspecific indicator, right? Because we don't really know what's causing the anemia to occur. So we didn't see any of that. So um, a former grad student of mine, Courtney Knight, back in 2014, compared the frequency of the lesions in Petra with some other sites in the region. Um, and we kind of, for um, sake of ease, we grouped them into urban agricultural village, uh, villages and um, people who were nomadic individuals or living in very rural contexts. And you can see that indeed the Petra individuals have pretty low frequencies of some of these nonspecific indicators of stress that we are looking at, right? And in fact, it's to some, to the point that it wasn't probably impacted by sampling bias, it is probably a, she could say, a, a notable difference. Um, and so we basically have, you know, a relatively healthy population at Petra based on these indicators, right? So um, these data need to be understood very carefully, though, because um, there are a lot of sort of caveats with looking at frequencies of pathologies. One of the problems is that bone lesions do not often have the time to form if a person is suffering from an acute disease, right? So if they have a long-term condition, even if that condition itself might not cause um, a particular bony response, their, the, their body might be taxed enough that you might get some of those you know, non-specific stress indicators. But if it's a very quickly acting disease that kills someone pretty quickly, um, or even if they recover, there's not gonna be a lot of um, evidence of this in the bone. So that's one problem. The second is that a lot of diseases, even if they can cause skeletal development of a lesion, they don't always do so. So this is another issue. Um, for example, tuberculosis is something that can impact the bone, but does so in only like three to 5% of the cases of people who have TB. Um, and then finally, or not finally, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, also, LEH, those lines in the teeth that are from stoppage of enamel growth in childhood, you can only see them if that issue resolves and the enamel starts growing normally again. So you can only see them if that person survived stress, right? So the fact that Petra has fewer cases of LEH, in this case it's DEH, but same thing, than the other sites, that might just mean that the kids at Petra were dying from that stress and we don't see the evidence of the LEH, whereas at the other places, they were actually surviving and you can see the LEH in their teeth later on, right? Um, 
And then, um, so what if, you know, one possible interpretation of this low frequency of lesions in Petra might actually be that they were impacted by a high mortality disease event that killed people very quickly, like the bubonic plague or like typhoid, right? Now, ancient DNA is not such an accessible thing in Petra, I mean, particularly of pathogens, because you have to have pretty good preservation for that. And so I haven't actually done that. I've had people, a lot of people ask me if they can do it, but I, I suspect because of the level of preservation in the remains um, that we won't really be able to get much viable D DNA, but maybe someday. But we can get at this another way, and that's by looking at age-related mortality, because the idea is if you have a normal sort of mortality curve, kind of like what you see, I, I mean, kind of like what you see for the, the September 20, 1918 um, Montreal and Quebec um, profile, right? You have a lot of kids dying, and then it kind of, these are deaths of all causes, even though it's during the flu epidemic, right? You kind of have, and you might, some, sometimes you see like a little increase right around 60 to 70, but in general, right, you're, that's sort of a normal mortality profile. If you all of a sudden have a bunch of people dying from an infectious disease that kind of everyone has the same chance of dying from it, you're going to have more of a cross section of the living population, right? It's going to sort of represent what the living population looked like in terms of age distribution, right? So the age at death profile can sometimes <laughs> reflect the risk of death by at a particular age, sometimes, but not so much when we're talking about archaeological context, because cemeteries are attritional samples, that is, you're getting kind of people dying over the course of a few generations, right? And so unless you have like a plague cemetery where everyone kind of dies at once, right? You're not really seeing mortality risk by age, right? Um, <clears throat> whoops. In addition, the age at death profiles, and this is, these are paleodemographers have found this, did I say mouse not working? <laughs> Um, have found this well into the past is that, um, oh, it's working there, but it's not working here. Oh, whatever. Um, oh, there we go. Sorry. I just need to move this down a bit. Um, that, um, yeah, so the demographers have found that actually looking at the age at death profile in a cemetery, uh, because it's kind of occurring, uh, it's, it's being built over time and the sample is being built over time, it's actually going to be impacted by things like fertility or immigration or emigration more than shifts in mortality at particular ages, right? So you have a bunch of people moving in um, who are young adults, say 20 or 30, all of a sudden, guess what? You're going to have a spike of deaths in that age category that kind of doesn't fit. Or if you have all of a sudden um, people are having way more kids, um, you know, and there's an increase of fertility, well, guess what? All of a sudden you're going to have a whole bunch more kids in the sample than you would normally expect, right? So it's going to kind of throw things off a little bit. Um, and this is referred to as demographic non-stationarity, right? That very few populations are demographically stable, right? We're always growing. We're always, our, pop, our numbers are growing and fluctuating through time. And then finally, um, the more obvious one is that this is actually a sample of the people who died, right? So it's not really reflective of the people who are living at the time, right? So, um, you know, you might have a good picture of people who died at the age of 22, but you know nothing about the other people um, when they were 22 in that particular sample, you know, the people that went on to live until 50, and at 50 years of age, they, they're part of the sample, right? So we don't know what they were like when they were 22 or why they survived, right? So, and the other people died at 22. So that's sort of, you know, one of those, this is referred to as the mortality bias, right? We're looking at people who died for a reason. They, they're, they're dead for a reason, right? And it's not always just age or senescence or whatever. So <clears throat> we decided to, um, there's some ways you can get around these biases. Um, and one is kind of having a slightly different um, age estimation technique than that is maybe a little better to use in samples like we have that are broken and sort of commingled. And that is to use 
um, cemento chronology. So this is a grad student worked on this a few years ago where she thin sectioned tooth roots and looked at the cementum, which is the outer layer on the tooth root. And by looking at these bands, these light and dark bands um, and counting them. So basically, you know, she was able to get an idea of how old the person is because those light and dark bands, you know, each pair form in a year, right? So you can essentially count each pair of light and dark bands, get a count, add it to, you know, the age that that part of the tooth root forms, right? And you end up with a pretty good age estimate. The problem is why this isn't used very often. Well, some samples, you can't do anything destructive. So that, you know, that, that rules this out. But even if you can, it's really difficult and it's really time consuming. So this is a really nice looking slide, right? Of the cementum um, bands. It's really difficult to see them typically. So this is something that is a, a huge headache actually generally, but it does end up giving a pretty decent age estimation. So what did we find? What did the Petra age at death profile look at look like? So that's on the left. Um, so that's sort of our raw age at death profile. And you'll see that there is a weird peak, right? At 30, about 30 to 39 years of age. So if you just looked at this, you'd be like, oh, well, there's a lot of people that are dying between 30 and 39. And maybe, so maybe there's some kind of disease that like, I don't know, like the, like the 1918 type of flu, right? There were a lot of young adults died. Well, we thought, you know, not really probably. And so um, a colleague of mine, Michael Price joined my grad student and I, cause he knows how to do a little more fancy modeling than we can. And so he sort of bumped up our hazard models, you know, so hazard models are something used actually by the insurance industry a lot to look at um, what's the risk of death at a particular age, right? So that's kind of what you're seeing at the bottom is as you get older, you know, your risk of death goes up, right? Um, so he was able to sort of adjust this by taking into consideration population decline and population growth. So the middle plot there is looking at what an age at death profile would look like kind of on a, you know, kind of on a general level, level if there was population decline, so like a zero, so the in between the band, the outer edge of the red band is then um, like negative 3%, right? This so set of this outer edge would be negative 3%. This is 0%. And then the other edge of the blue band is plus 3% growth. And um, in fact, our model looks a little more based on, you know, his assessment of a population growth situation, right? So more likely we're having demographic non-stationarity that's impacting the amount of 30 to 39 year olds that are in the group. Either there are a bunch of people moving in around that age, or was there a previous spike in fertility? And now those people happen to be, there are a lot of them in that age cohort, right? And so they're, they're dying off, you know, who knows? Um, that's that you can maybe get at from a, um, some other techniques, but in general, what we're seeing is population growth occurring, not that there is all of a sudden this spike of deaths from 30 to 39. Um, so kind of in sum with our Petra example, so check my time, oh, perfect. Um, we've got low evidence or, um, you know, not much evidence of physiological stress or nonspecific infections. We don't have really evidence of metabolic disorders or specific diseases, although, you know, it's possible that the condition of the collection, the commingling, the fragmentation makes it difficult to kind of piece together um, what may be a diagnosable condition. Um, but it didn't, it didn't really, there was nothing really kind of that you wouldn't expect, I haven't seen before, let me put it that way. Um, there's no evidence of a kind of a catastrophic mortality episode where a bunch of people were dying from, I don't know, the plague or something. Um, and we seem to have evidence of population growth from about zero to 3%, more or less, going on in the city while this assemblage, while these tombs were being used for burials. So <clears throat> well, the second example, and I'm going to take a sip of water because that was a lot of talking, actually is kind of more the interesting one. 
um, in terms of paleopathology. So this involves a much later skeletal sample recovered from the site of Tel Hespan, um, which is a Tel site, which means that over a number of years, in this case, it's about 2,400 years, um, occupation layers built up to create like a big mound, right? Um, that, you know, a lot of Middle Eastern sites are in this form. Um, and they, the main occupation periods kind of ended in the 13th century, but during the 19th century, the mid to late 19th century, one of the buildings on the top of the tell, um, the building dates to the 13th century, but they use the collapsed remains of the building for burial of 20 adults and 32 kids. So during this period in Hispan, um, this part of Jordan was part of the, well, pretty much all of Jordan was part of the Ottoman Empire. But at this time, you know, this was, as, as with any, any historical period, it's really hard to control nomadic tribes. And these were pastoral nomads. These are agro-pastoral agro tribes who lived um, around the Tell. They didn't really build much. Um, they probably modified some of the, the old structures to, to, you know, use for storage and that kind of thing. But they were most likely living in tents like modern Bedouin do or some do today. Um, they probably grew wheat or other crops near the tell and cared for herds of sheep and goats and maybe camels. And the Ottomans kind of, they kind of were under their radar for much of the, this later Ottoman history because they were pastoral nomads, right? They were kind of ephemeral, not easy to control, not easy to tax, right? Not easy to conscript into the army um, until in the late 19th century, they decided to do so. Right, and so this is kind of the period, this is kind of what's going on underneath um, um, what we're seeing in the archeological record. So what we found in the human remains were that about, <coughs> excuse me, depending on which, these are commingled as well, because this is my life. Um, and that about 50 to 100%, depending on which bone you were looking at, of infants under the age of two were dying with lesions, um, a number of different lesions. And I realize we're looking at a lot of different things here, but we have um, in a lot of these, these are, you know, baby cranial bones. So they look kind of funny if you're used to seeing adults, um, you know, the sphenoids and the parts of the occipital and the zygomatic and the mandible and the maxilla and the temporal all have this porosity um, they have either porosity in the, in the cortical bone or porous new bone formation. Um, the scapula, you know, your shoulder blade and the ilium in the pelvis, same thing. Um, we also have flaring and porosity of the sternal rib ends. Kind of see up here. We have in the long bones. So these are bones of the arms and the legs. We see curvature, you know, normal curvature, deformation of the growth plate end. So they're kind of flaring out. They're very porous and sort of fraying looking. Um, and they have some kind of weird shape anomalies. And then we have some long bones like you see on the far left that have some new bone formation as well. So we kind of, you know, this struck me at first because I'd never seen anything like that in all the skeletal samples I'd looked at in Jordan for the previous, at this time it must've been 25 years. And so I was like, huh. And I said, I think I know what this is. And so um, a grad student and I kind of went back and looked at the, the bones more closely. They're kept in storage in Jordan. Um, and we were able to determine that based on these sort of diagnostic features that these were children that most likely suffered from scurvy or vitamin C deficiency and rickets or vitamin D deficiency right before they were the, um, at the, before they, died at the age of two. Now they didn't die, we can't say they died from these things, right? Um, but they were definitely suffering from these metabolic diseases before, at the time that they died. It probably contributed to their death, but we don't know, you know exactly what the, what the cause of death is in this case. Um, and I feel like there was something else I was gonna say and now I, now I forgot what it was, but I'm sure it'll come back to me. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so what role does vitamin D play in bone maintenance? Well, it's actually quite essential. Um, 
So it's for normal metabolism of bone minerals, vitamin D is, is, is very essential. And dysfunction at any level of this vitamin D um, metabolic system will impact bone mineralization, right? And so here's sort of a, a diagram showing some of the different, basically the, the cascade of issues that occur if you have a, a, a shortage of vitamin D or a deficiency of vitamin D. Now this sufficiency in vitamin D can be from, um, you know, normally we are able to, you know, our body synthesizes vitamin D um, triggered by UVB radiation, right? So just exposure to the sun, if that's lacking, that's going to be an issue. If you're for some reason having a dietary deficiency, that can be an issue. But it's also there are many genetic conditions that can actually result in your body not being able to properly synthesize vitamin D. For example, your vitamin D receptor, receptors, sorry, um, in your body can, um, you know, be malfunctioning. Um, it, there, there could be increased renal excretion of phosphorus. Um, there could be issues with the parathyroid hormone or the, you know, the parathyroid gland. Um, and even a deficiency in calcium can kind of um, exacerbate a vitamin D deficiency. Um, so we've got all of these different factors that can actually lead to vitamin D deficiency that we need to keep in mind, or in that, I'm sorry, that can lead to the development of rickets that we need to keep in mind that go beyond just UVB radiation and um, nutritional problems. So kind of just to sum up what vitamin D does to bone, it's basically what we saw, right? Increased osteoclast activity, meaning those cells that take away bone that resulted in increased density. Um, we have slowed or inhibited bone mineralization and biomechanical changes in bone shape, like the curvature and all that kind of thing. Um, we do have the, um, the normal, I'm sorry, the abnormal bone growth because what can happen when vitamin D levels improve is you get reparative bone growth, right? It can sort of resolve the issue um, over time. But sometimes it might be recurring, right? You sort of go back and forth and so you'll have sort of a mix of these. Now with vitamin C, people don't know as much about how, how vitamin C impacts bone. And actually, it doesn't really impact bone directly, but it is essential for collagen synthesis. So humans and primate, a lot of other primates and guinea pigs, right, are the, some of the mammals that do not synthesize their own, they can't biosynthesize vitamin C. So the only way we can get it is through consuming things that have vitamin C, right? Um, and if you don't get enough vitamin C, basically there's a, um, tissues with a substantial component of collagen will weaken and fail. So things like the blood vessel walls resulting in hemorrhaging, right? And um, you, you, even with minimal trauma to vascularized tissue can cause hemorrhaging. Um, and so this is kind of when you think about people who have scurvy, um, I don't know how much you think about them, but I think about them a lot, um, as they have like bleeding gums and they'll have like a kind of a bloody looking rash on their skin. And, you know, so you have this, um, this, kind of hyper hemorrhaging. And what that does is it, you know, it results in, uh, well, I'll get that in a second, it results in particular bony features, but also can mimic rickets in some way, because you also have that decreased mineralization as well. So the bones can also look bowed in kids and that kind of thing. So, right, vitamin C, um, while it, it's not, essential for bone per se, but it will, if you have these hematomas on the surface of bone due to this damage and, the, and hemorrhaging, you're going to have subperiosteal bone formation, right? Inflammation due to hemorrhaging results in cortical porosity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> I'm kind of thinking about time. That's why I'm kind of rushing through these things. So what is causing this at the site, right? So UV exposure could be one factor, right? Um, but we know that unlike a lot of places like Northern Europe, for example, um, the UV uh, radiation in Hespan in central Jordan is probably not an issue, right? And you can see that even better when you um, move in more closely, right? There is clearly enough UV, UVB radiation in this 
in this area um, so that these people should not be getting rickets, right? Um, the, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say something. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, but there are some factors that can possibly impact UVB radiation. And one that people have pointed to a lot because this is the Middle East, right? Is that cultural factors such as clothing could impact things, right? So women traditionally tend to cover their hair, cover their head, um, maybe wear long sleeves, long, a long dress, right? And today, more so than in the past, women wear the niqab, which is a, a, a scarf across the face, right? So these things can limit UVB radiation um, when this woman's outside wearing these things. Um, but the results of studies that have looked at this are kind of inconclusive, which is interesting. So I kind of just pulled a couple up here where one, <clears throat> I mean, they're looking at slightly different things. One was looking at whether or not a mother who was either uncovered or wearing the headscarf, the hijab or the niqab, um, in her kids, in her newborns, were they more or less likely to have vitamin D deficiency? And there was no difference in their kids. Which was sort of odd because that, you know, a mother's vitamin D level does affect her baby's level, the kind of what they start off with. So another study found that there was, and looking at the mothers themselves or women themselves, did find a significant difference in their vitamin D levels, right, between whether if they were uncovered or not. Um, another study in Jordan found that there's a seasonal pattern actually where newborns born in certain months are have lower or higher vitamin D levels. And so this could actually play a role when you think about it, right? These are agro-pastoral tribes. They might be moving seasonally. And so maybe we're getting just sort of the picture of the kids who, you know, happen to be more, it's a season where they're more likely to die, I guess you could say, because of um, the UVB radiation at the camp where they happen to be, where they're being buried in this case. And there are a number of other factors, right? That could be, that could be possible. Diet is a big one, genetics, right? Those are kind of the other two main factors in addition to um, UV exposure. So we've been kind of digging into this a little bit to try to illuminate what in the world is going on here. And so kind of our, our hypotheses, these are not, these are more research questions than hypotheses, I guess, the way they're structured, but um, do we have cultural practices potentially impacting UVB radiation? Um, or is it a matter of dietary deficiency, particularly in the case of scurvy, because um, though I'm kind of focused more on rickets in the latter half of this talk. Um, are weaning practices um, possibly impacting who gets rickets and who doesn't? Um, or scurvy for that matter. Is the nutritional status of the mother important, right? And so if that's the case, we might be able to, if we see evidence of in utero rickets and scurvy, then that would tell us that there's something going on probably with a mom, right? And then are there genetic factors, kind of those ever-present genetic factors that could be resulting in, you know, kids not being able to make it to two years of age, or if it's an X-linked condition, right, you might have more males with it than females. So we have these kind of thoughts in our head. And so we're kind of trying to go into using different methods to figure out, did only babies and infants have rickets? Um, did anyone actually survive rickets if they had it in infancy, right? We only have the kids who died before the age of two. We don't really have evidence of anyone else with rickets. So it's kind of weird, right? Um, you'd expect to see some older kids maybe with some rickets or residual rickets if they lived. Um, and what are the demographic patterns? Again, going into that sex and age um, patterning of having rickets in childhood that can help us illuminate some of these questions. So to partially answer them, we've been um, turning to a relatively new technique to study um, rickets in childhood. Um, and so we're, we turn to the adult teeth um, or the teeth of adults, or teeth of people who survived childhood rickets, if they had it, right? So people who survived childhood, let's just put it that way. And um, what happens in, in, we're looking at thin sections of the teeth, particularly the dentin in the teeth, because 
during um, dentin formation, which is kind of on the inside of the teeth for those who um, aren't familiar with dental um, anatomy, right? It's the internal tissue within the tooth. When that's developing and that somebody has vitamin D deficiency, you'll see the development of um, poorly mineralized dentin, which is referred to as interglobular dentin. And these look like empty spaces, um, or they are empty spaces, sorry, that look black if you're looking at it under a polarized microscope. Um, and they can form randomly in dentin. So it's not every time you see IgD, it's not necessarily rickets. But what, if you do see sort of a, um, a continue, not a continuous, but sort of points along the, and knowing the, the way that dentin forms, right? If you see a particular, um, if you see IgD kind of at particular points along one zone of mineralization or one zone of growth, that's gonna tell us that it's probably due to something like vitamin D deficiency, not just sort of random. Um, so, the, and we're able to, because we know about dentin formation, right? We're able to sort of get an indicator of when it formed, when in childhood, right? And we're also able to look at if it's in utero or prenatal by measuring the distance from, this is the junction or the, the boundary between the enamel and the dentin called the amylodentinal junction. And if you measure from that point up to what's called the neonatal line, um, you'll see how much enamel formed in utero, right? And the neonatal line is something, it's just basically a sign of stress that the child endured undergoing when they were being born, right? So it is a stressful event. And then you take basically, because enamel and dentin grow at the, essentially the same rate, um, you can take an equidistant measurement into the dental enamel and anything within that, you know, in that, space between, you know, the, the enamel, I mean, the dentin that was supposedly growing right around the time they were born and earlier, right? If you have IgD in there, that will tell you that there's prenatal IgD, right? So it's a really great method that was developed by colleagues um, of mine up at McMaster University. And so we then turn to, our, I know I hate tables in slides, but I just, it's there whatever, we, we looked at 22 teeth from 20 individuals, 64% of them had at least one episode of IgD or vitamin D deficiency. We don't really see a difference in males and females, um, not really notable. So 43% of the males had IgD, 33% of the females that we tested had IgD. Now you're probably wondering, well, why didn't you just look at the kids that died and see if there are more males and more females. Well, you can't tell the sex of kids um, with any sort of, by, by looking at their skeleton, right? You basically, until a kid goes through puberty, those sexual characteristics, so sexually dimorphic characteristics in the skeleton don't develop. It's one of those suite of secondary dental, uh, I'm sorry, secondary, I'm so, the teeth are on my mind. Secondary sexual characteristics, right? So. We had to turn to adults to kind of get our first idea of, is there a sex-based difference, right? In whether or not people had kids, I mean, people had rickets in childhood. But what was interesting actually is the age patterning of the episodes. So um, these are, so the bottom of the graph is, is age, right? Prenatal and then one to 2.5 years, et cetera. Um, one thing you notice is that in general, people over the age, most of the episodes of rickets were over people over the age of 2.5 years, right? That people had in childhood. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence of rickets from that earlier period, right? Where we're seeing the kids dying, right? Because we have them in our sample. Um, but, um, and one of that, some of that might be, I mean, we have teeth that, you know, the, the teeth, we have two basically are using first molars and second molars that form at slightly different ages. And the first molars are the ones that would capture that. And we have first molars, so it's not like a matter of sampling. Um, so that's interesting. And then the other thing is that, well, we don't have any females who had sort of that prenatal to 2.5 years of uh, rickets in childhood. Now it could be, so we have a couple of people that are of indeterminate sex, like we, their, their skull was not, it was kind of ambiguous. 
and they could be females. So there's that, there may be some females in there. Um, but it does maybe point to, well, maybe females who had rickets during that period are actually dying. And the males are, well, everyone's kind of dying, but the males are more likely to survive, possibly, right? Possibly, this is sort of a, a hypothesis that we can build on, right? Um, I do have some examples of what some of this IGD looks like in the Hespan sample, but um, I'm kind of starting to get concerned about time. It's already 520. And so these are nice. I'll just point out one of them is that this is one of the prenatal um, examples where we have, and this was actually a kid. Um, so this was somebody who died between eight and nine years of age. And um, so one of the few non-adults that we looked at, and they actually had sign of prenatal rickets. And then another, so that's seen on the left. And then on the right is another period of deficiency that lasted about one to three years of age. Um, and you can actually measure, and this is something I'm doing just this very moment, is measuring um, how big this is along the dentin tubules to get an idea of how long the period of rickets lasted because you know those it grows at a pretty regular rate. So you can kind of figure out how many whatever micrometers grow in a day. And so what we know is that not all infants with rickets died, right? Um, people experience multiple epids, episodes of rickets during childhood. Um, we don't really see a, a clear age pattern, right? Where it, maybe it seems to be that if you had rickets later on, you seem to survive. Um, I should, and as I mentioned before, we don't really have a lot of older kids in the sample who died with rickets. So it might mean that it's a survivable period or it just has something to do with the way rickets manifest in the bone with age. It's gonna be more dramatic during periods of rapid skeletal growth, like six months to two years, right? So maybe what that's what we're seeing is we just don't see it in these older kids. And there's no difference in sex in the adults. So we're gonna move forward on this by doing more IGD analysis of deciduous teeth of the kids who actually died to see what they're with rickets, to see what their history is. Um, and we're gonna estimate the sex of infants using a new technique and we're going to do incremental dental collagen analysis to look at diets. So Kira, who's here, um, is working with me and Tanya Zezewski, who's in biochem and molecular biology over on this side. Um, we're doing proteomics to look at sex of these kids who are dying, right? And some of them have rickets and some of them don't. So we're trying to figure out, is there a sex bias in who is dying with rickets and who isn't. So amelogenin, um, the protein amelogenin actually is really important for dental enamel formation. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of it in dental enamel. Um, and there's actually two variants, right? Based on whether or not it's being coded on the um, X chromosome or on the Y chromosome. Um, and so we can look for evidence of, you know, if there's only evidence of amyl X, that's probably a female, though you have to do some little more work on that because um, it, it's a little complicated. You might, the Y just might not be showing up. And then if you have both Y and X forms, right, then it's probably a boy. So that's going on this year. <clears throat> Another thing that's going to be started by a new grad student, Delphi Husky, along with a, co uh, a colleague of mine at USF, who's our, we're playing for, them, for football this week, aren't we? Um, and that's looking at isotopes. So Carbon and nitrogen isotopes basically vary in human tissue based on what we're eating. And so I'm not gonna go into this too much. Carbon is based on, on the x-axis here, varies due to like how many, what type of plants you're eating and what types of plants the animals you're eating are eating, right? And so it kind of looks, it tracks dietary changes. Um, and then nitrogen is a little, I find a little more interesting because it, it kind of looks at where someone is on the food chain, how many plants versus um, animals they're eating. And with babies, they're actually one step above their mother that they're getting, or the, or the woman that they're getting breast milk from, right? So they are kind of one, they have a higher nitrogen isotope level than the breast milk source, right? And so as a kid is kind of undergoing weaning and then eventually getting the solid food, you'll see this slow decline 
in their nitrogen isotope values. And we're going to do this a little more detailed than this example. We're going to be looking at increments of dentin that can more closely track different ages through time. Um, because we're on this dentin kick, why not, right? And so you could kind of see here how, um, you know, sort of the age markers in, um, you know, in the, in the dental formation of this first molar. And then you can plot out the carbon, carbon and nitrogen um, from each increment to sort of track dietary changes. And in the case of the blue um, on this graph, I believe it's the blue, it's the nitrogen. You can see it kind of fall right at a particular age, which suggests that's the period they were undergoing weaning. So you can get an idea, okay, well, the kids are they who are dying, did they have a different weaning pattern than the kids who survived or the, or the people who survived or are they, you know, is, are, are their diets kind of like really different based on whether or not they have scurvy or not, right? So this is another thing we're doing. And then I have some colleagues at George Mason who are doing enamel microstructure to look at growth disruption and stress. And this, he's doing it with his grad student. So like those enamel hypoplasias, he does a more detailed analysis of looking at parachomata in teeth, which form at you know, like every eight days, basically, um, but it takes eight days for this enamel to form in between one parachomata and the other. And so you can get an idea of how long stressful episodes last and um, kind of a lot more detail than what we can normally get just looking at them macroscopically. So there's that and sort of track that with, you know, enamel, uh, I'm sorry, with um, the IGD and that kind of stuff. And yeah, so I have lots of people to thank for helping us with this work. It's, um, it's been a lot of fun. It kind of keeps me getting up in the morning. Um, and of course, I want to thank my grad students who are really fantastic. Um, got some here today, some maybe online, um, and our funding sources. And so thank you. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> Online. Oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. Uh, so we'll open up for about five or 10 minutes of questions. So um, this is for people in person and online. Mm -hmm. If you're online, be sure to put your questions in the chat box and we'll get to them um, as we go. So we'll start with people in person. Do you, does anyone have any questions? Did you find any other diseases that might be associated with um, deficiency, um, like maybe kwashiorkor, or were you just tracking um, scurvy's and vitamin D deficiency? Well, you can see, so it's hard to see sort of, you know, kwashiorkor or marasmus or whatever, because we don't have the soft tissue, right? But you can see evidence of wasting in the, in, in the children's remains as a result of like famine and stuff like that. So there've been other studies that have done that um, and yeah, it's something that we would definitely look at. We can't really pinpoint the cause. It'd be hard, you know, it be, might be hard to say, okay, is it this or is it rickets, right? Is it, are they also suffering from extreme protein malnutrition? Um, their isotopes might say something about that. But yeah, so that's, it's, it's definitely very probable and we can look at it, but it's hard to pinpoint what exactly would be causing it. At least I don't know how. Yeah. That's Second question. question. So along with um, rickets and scurvy, rickets and scurvy, like you say, generally, if you have a fair amount of sun, you usually mm -hmm. don't see them. I remember some old studies, we looked at some of the WIC kids and we compared kids in Michigan, low sun versus Mississippi, and it was a statistically significant difference. And I think that was some of the changes that they made. Yeah, Were you definitely. able to see any type of maybe a new nuance in some genetic predisposition that was also causing the scurvy or the vitamin D deficiency? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So I kind of skipped over it, but there is, um, there is, there are known genetic polymorphisms in air populations that can result in kind of a predisposition of rickets. So we know it's there. It's, you know, again, that the DNA 
preservation and knowing where to look on the DNA, it might be really hard to kind of, you know, kind of do genetic analysis with these remains to do that. It would be like really cool, but you know, I don't know if it would really work, but yeah. I mean, and the other thing I, I think of, it's like, you know, uh, you know, skin color and melanin in the skin also plays a big role in, you know, whether or not you're going to get rickets. So, and I kind of, again, skipped over this, but I was like, if somebody moves from like Kenya to, you know, they're born in Kenya and they move to London and they have a lot of melanin, right. That they are going to be more likely to get rickets or vitamin D deficiency. They probably won't get rickets, but vitamin D deficiency than somebody, you know, who has less melanin and lives in London. So it's, you know, I'm kind of thinking of that too, but I don't, you know, I don't know <laughs> what skin color they have. I mean, I can kind of look at or how much melanin they have, right? I can sort of get an idea of people living there today, but, you know, right? It's sort of, so we're trying to kind of look at all of these different factors, right? That can impact vitamin, I mean, sorry, UVB radiation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is from Helen Dixon. She says, can you tell us more about your agreement with Jordan when it comes to which slash how many teeth and bones you can sample destructively for your work? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question because there's a lot of talk today about ethics of working with human remains. And um, Jordan, thankfully, and this is why I thank the Department of Antiquities, is that they're very supportive of this work actually. And they do allow us to actually export complete assemblages of human remains um, and samples that would be destroyed. They really don't have any, um, I mean, they just say, great, send us the results of your study. I mean, so yeah, we're really lucky. Not everyone is like that. I mean, I, I you know, I talk to the people I work with because I want to get a sense of what the local people in like in Petra more what the, how they think about, you know, the treatment of human remains. And they also, I mean, some people are kind of more like superstitious about working with the human remains, but they don't feel like that they should be, you know, stay in the country or, or anything along those lines. Any more else? No? I'll go ahead and close it out then. So thank you everyone for joining us in person and online. And thank you, Dr. Perry as oh, well. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you everyone. Thank you.